started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Motivalli, and I am the Division Director for the Division of Community and Education. This is uh, our USDA NIFA Education Program uh, webinar, and I want to welcome you on behalf of NIFA uh, to this webinar, and we really appreciate your participation uh, in the webinar. Uh, just a few ground rules uh, related to Zoom uh, that you want to be aware of. First, we are recording this uh, session, so that, that's uh, going on right now. Uh, also, uh, when we're going along, you can enter your questions. If you have a question during the uh, presentation, you can enter your question into the question and answer box that should be in front of you. And uh, as we get to uh, our question and answer period, we will strive to answer those questions. So we will have uh, sections to this uh, presentation related to the, uh, to the different programs. And then we'll have short question and answer periods after each of those sections. And then at the end, we'll have a longer question and answer uh, period. I have uh, uh, with me uh, six of our national program leaders in the Division of Community and Education. And I also uh, two uh, program specialists who are helping us uh, and contributed a lot to this presentation. Uh, I want to introduce them, uh, Kellyanne Jones Jumpguard and Ara Stubb. Uh, thank you very much for, for helping move this along. The agenda for today's uh, webinar will be first to provide a, an introduction to the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and the Division of Community and Education. Also, uh, we'll give some helpful resources for those of you who are interested in applying, haven't done that before, or just interested in getting more information. Uh, we'll provide some web links for you. Uh, to be able to utilize um, uh, as you see fit. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do an overview of our Division of Community Education uh, Competitive Education Programs. And as I mentioned before, we've divided those into three different sections and uh, we'll have question and answer periods after each one of those. And then we'll have a final question and answer period. Those of you who are interested in getting this PowerPoint, because it will does contain a lot of very useful information, we'll be sending that out to you uh, after the webinar. So with that, let's uh, let's go on and and, and move to the uh, next slide. Just a little bit of background about the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. It is in the U.S. Department of Agriculture as part of research, education, and economics mission area. And it has a budget uh, this last year of fiscal year 2021 of $1.9 billion. And what NIFA does primarily is to provide grants. Uh, one type of those grants are what are called capacity grants, or uh, oftentimes they're called formula funds. And these are provided to land grant universities to support research and extension. We also have many, uh, a diverse group of competitive grants to support research education extension at uh, a diversity of institution, which includes land grant universities, non land grant universities, uh, minority serving institutions, um, and the eligibility for each of the programs is laid out in the request for applications, which is a document that is um, put out, which is an announcement really about that grant program. Uh, and it's a very valuable uh, document to refer to because it does provide information, including who is eligible for that specific program. Next slide, please. Of course, NIFA uh, programs cover many topics. Uh, we're going to focus on education uh, among those, but of course, education includes uh, many areas. And so 
education often um, touches on many of these technical areas. And so it's a very important part of the NIFA mission uh, is, is focused on education. Next slide, please. So uh, NIFA's education programs are primarily housed within the Division of Community and Education, uh, which is part of the Institute of Youth, Family and Community. But there are other education programs within um, other NIFA divisions. And among these are programs such as the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, uh, which has an acronym of FNEP, uh, Extension Education and USDA Climate Hubs Partnership Program, a new program, uh, Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program, and uh, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. Some of these programs cover research, education, extension. They're integrated programs. Education is a very important part of those programs. Next slide, please. What are the general goals of NIFA's education portfolio? And as you can see, there's quite a few of those. Uh, one of those is really uh, to improve uh, general public scientific and agricultural literacy. This is often programs focused at an early educational level. One big area is what we call workforce development. And what we're trying to do is recruit and train a skilled workforce to face the many challenges that uh, are there in uh, agriculture and food sectors. We're trying to also improve the educational methodologies, how those are done and increase engagement. Uh, and so there's a, a fair amount of effort to focus on uh, things like curriculum development and teacher training and non-formal instruction and also experiential learning. We're also really trying to uh, promote and advance science. And so these are a focus on graduate and postdoctoral training by providing fellowships. Uh, so that's a very important part of this. And then a, a very important part of our division as well is to work on strengthening the educational capacity of minority serving institutions in many different educational areas, basically building capacity in, in education. Next slide, please. So uh, we wanted to give you kind of a pretty um, intensive uh, exposure to these various programs. As you hear, this is just illustrating where these programs are in terms of the institutions they serve and uh, as well as the general overall goal of increasing uh, a skilled and, and trained workforce. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go specifically into the various programs that are being offered. Next slide, please. We did mention uh, about the importance of uh, providing you with resources. So this slide I think is a very important slide because it, gives you the links where you can get more information about NIFA programs, not just the educational program, but in general. Very important uh, to, for example, look at the events calendar, what's coming up in terms of grants and webinars and, and things like that within NIFA. What are the funding opportunities? What are these uh, requests for applications? How do I get to them uh, to be able to uh, apply? and learn more about the requirements and eligibility for those programs. Uh, and there's additional information about how you specifically go about uh, applying for a NIFA grant and how, where do you submit it and more information about uh, that whole process. So if you're new to the grant process, this is really a great place to look at these various web links. As I mentioned before, we'll be providing this PowerPoint, so you'll be having those links uh, for you to further explore. Next slide, please. Okay, the first section that we're gonna talk about is our K through 14 education programs. And who better to discuss that is our Dr. Carlos Ortiz is a national program leader 
and he leads many of these programs. So we'll start off with him. Sure, thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Peter mentioned, my name is Carlos Ortiz and I'm the national program leader leading the K-14 portfolio of formal education. So in addition to uh, our Agriculture in the Classroom program that we, we have and we compete every five years, so the next time that we'll be competed is in 2023, we have another set of programs that complement our K-14 portfolio. One of them being the SPECA program, is a secondary uh, education and really program. And really the goal of this program is to promote complementary and synergistic linkages between secondary education, as well as post-secondary and higher education uh, institutions. The goal of the program is really to enhance the quality of K-14 education in order to really to meet the workforce needs uh, of the future. Uh, we uh, seek programs that will increase the diversity of the students as well as their capacity and their, uh, 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 their, their want to just really pursue a two or four year degree in agricultural and food sciences. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we, we seek to promote and strengthen these uh, linkages between uh, institutions of uh, uh, secondary education or two years or four year degrees. Next slide, please. Uh, the SPECA program, we oftentimes have, and very brief, briefly, we're, we're going to give you a little bit of details about the, what the program is seeking to fund, how much funding we have for each one of them. So in the case of SPECA, we, have, we make grants that go between $500,000 to $300,000, and they will depend depending on the grant type or the project that you're trying to develop, right? Like one will be like a regular project, which is a smaller project, or a collaboration project which in this case will be the ones uh, gearing towards the $300,000. For this year, the competition for this program has already passed, but as Peter mentioned, I would recommend that you look at the uh, NIFA calendar of events and the schedule of RFAs that will really tell you when are we scheduling to release the next competition, as well as when the applications due date will be for the same. Next slide. So the second program that I wanted to talk to you about is the WAMS programs. This is the women and minorities in STEM disciplines. The goal of this program is really to enhance and increase the participation of women and underrepresented minorities in uh, STEM uh, with a special focus with rural areas. So we are really trying to get proposals uh, and projects that will support the training and the, uh, uh, the training of, of, of women and minorities from rural areas that go into ag and food disciplines. The target here again is K-14 students, so all the way from K-12, all the way to community college uh, education. And really we support the creation and adaptation and of learning materials, as well as uh, some of those synergistic linkages, uh, similar to what SPECA does, but the special focus here is women and STEM, and uh, women and minorities in STEM. Next, please. In the case of WAMS, the project uh, uh, budget is $100,000 projects that go for two or three years. Uh, again, the competition for this program, we are almost uh, gearing towards the end of the fiscal year. So a lot of these programs have already been competed for fiscal year 2021. But we, uh, as we wait for appropriations for fiscal year 2022, again, I would encourage you to just look at the request for applications uh, calendar. And we can, you can see when they will be competed again and when the proposals will be uh, due. So in the case of WAMS, the proposals were due in January. So I would expect something similar for the next fiscal year. Next, yeah. So in the case of the next program, this, this is called the Professional Development for Agricultural Literacy. And it's part of our, of our Agricultural and Food Research Initiative. Uh, we call it AFRI. AFRI is the largest program that NIFA has and it contains many, many soft programs within it, PEDAL being, being one of them. In the case of, the, of PEDAL, what we're seeking to do here is to provide funds to, to, um, in, to support the training of K-14 education professionals. So these will be teachers, administrators, and any other professional that, that plays a role in teaching students. The goal of PEDAL is really to support immersi uh, immersive learning experiences uh, for, for, for the teachers, uh, PEDAL does not support any uh, training or activities for students. Everything is centered around teachers, and we want to provide them hands-on research, hands-on extension ex experiences that will allow them to better teach uh, students 
about food and agricultural concepts. Again, the funds cannot be used to support any students. And we really encourage uh, projects to integrate social emotional skills into their program as they will, else will better train teachers to use uh, and to, and to uh, manage the classroom as they are teaching. Next slide. In the case of WAMS, the deadline for WAMS was actually yesterday. Um, so for the next funding cycle, uh, the, the RFA that we have currently published contains the deadlines for the next funding cycle, and they will be in September of 2022. So uh, if you're interested in the PL program, I would encourage you to go right now uh, on your browser and just uh, search for AFRI uh, NIFA, uh, NIFA PDAL and it will take you to the RFA and you will be able to spend some time really seeing what we're seeking for this program. Um, in the case of PDAL, the projects that we are offering support up to, up to $500,000 for project periods of three to four years and we have a requirement that 50% of the, of the costs are used for participant support. Uh, we have what we call standard as well as phase strengthening standard grants. Phase standard strengthening standard uh, grants are for institutions that have that are either minority serve institutions, uh, small or mid-sized, which means less than 17,500 students, or come from EBSCOR states, which a list of them can be found on our website. Uh, in the case of, of PIDAL, again, it is the goal of this program is to support the training and immersive learning experiences for teachers and education administrators and other professionals. Next slide. So in the same um, uh, pipeline of the K-14 education, we have a, a program that is maybe three years uh, old uh, called Agricultural Workforce Training, where the focus of this program is really to train students at the community college level. So what we're seeking to do with, through AWT is to train the workforce of the future, right? We are asking that all the projects that are uh, developed and submitted through AWT uh, provide industry accepted credentials to the participants of the program. So in this case, it's not just about providing them experiences or hands-on training, but the project actually has to provide industry accepted credentials to those students that are part of the project. Um, funds for this project should, can be used for, for faculty and for staff and materials and such, but we're asking that a portion of them are also used for to support the students and their enrollment into this program. The, the important part about uh, AWT is that the uh, project has to be developed by or in active partnership with a community, community junior technical uh, or, or technical college or institute as well as their industry partners. Anyone else can be applied to it, but the project must be developed by or in active partnership with these academic institutions. Next slide. In the case of AWT, the deadline uh, for this year is actually next Thursday, this, this coming Thursday, June, June 17th. Again, the projects uh, are supported at a level of $500,000 for a project period of three or four, uh, or four years. Um, again, we have standard and phase strengthening standard grants, and we really don't have any limits on the number of applications uh, but we may limit the number of awards that, may, that we make for institution. And all of this information can be found in the request for application. Um, next slide, and I think that's Maurice. Thanks, Carlos. It's a, it's a pleasure being on here with everyone and thank you so much for joining. I am Dr. Maurice Smith, the National Program Leader working with 1890 programs, as well as our AFRI EWD FANE. And FAIN, that, that wonderful acronym, as you can see up here, is, it stands for Food and Agriculture Non-Formal Education. So with this program, the, within the funding priorities, we support the content development and activities for non-formal education to foster development of technology savvy youth. So as a um, uh, component or focal point of um, Projects must develop activities that cultivate interest uh, within the STEM and food and agriculture sciences supported by the six farm bill priority areas of AFRI. Those include data science, uh, including artificial intelligence, automation, and robotics, as well as gene editing and biotechnology. So FANE um, 
you know, we want to uh, those applications proposals to address um, developing content and activities to enhance youth's understanding, as well as uh, they should complement and build upon other existing programs that successfully demonstrate positive youth development strategies or outcomes. Now, FAIN has an interesting component uh, or what I may say a golden nugget to it is, is that the, the, we always talk about uh, programming as you know, programming, meeting the needs of the community. Um, but FAIN has a more most important nugget as in including the interests of the youth. And the youth have a uh, have an instrumental component in the planning, implementation, and evaluation in FAIN. And that's one of the um, um, components is to, to, to effectively have a sound program or project. We, we had more of, um, in the RFA having youth to be a component in the planning stage. Also with uh, FAIN, we have a C, the Civic Engagement Experience for Youth. This promotes uh, non-formal education civic engagement experiences for 4-H youth. This has a strong component of um, developing the National 4-H Conference. Um, this is the target range is for 4-H youth in grades 10 through 12 for 15 to 19 years old. Next slide. So with FANG, um, the proposed budgets for FANG is 750,000 total per project for a project period of three to four years and C with the 1 million uh, total per project for project period of four to five years. Although we have already um, went through our first <laughs> First phase for the um, application deadline was made the sixth for this year. We have included the application deadline for next year's August the 4th, 2022, 5 p.m. Eastern time for the application deadline uh, for, for FAME. Um, and if you want more um, information and details, uh, there will be a link provided to, uh, towards the RFA. All right, and next slide. Okay, we are now um, have a, a question and answer period for this section or other um, questions you might have. Please enter your questions in the Q&A uh, box or if you would prefer to do that by um, uh, orally, raise your hand and um, Aristab will, will um, uh, get you uh, up to be able to ask your question. So please submit your question and answer. I noticed uh, already some, some uh, questions were added in and I know Dr. Ortiz is uh, already uh, answering some of those. Uh, let's just ask some here. Is, is FAIN only for projects focused on grades 10 through 12 or is that the, is that what we see Smith? So, so Fain, Fain is, sorry about that. So Fain is uh, set up for younger youth. Um, it's not totally target for 4-H youth, but for 4-H youth uh, um, ages for younger youth in that um, K through 12 uh, target range. We got another no. question related to DEY. Sorry, I hear some feedback. I apologize for that. We got someone with uh, raising their hand. If that's okay, uh, we'll do we'll allow them to ask uh, the question live. So let me just it's from Sergio Pichardo. So Sergio, can I think you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question? Yes, I already did. Like I hope you guys are going to. To hear me, my question is, I work for, uh, with ABAC, is the Abraham Walden Agricultural College in Tifton, Georgia. We are a four years um, a higher institution. And um, well, I would like to know what type of projects can I submit to get funds? My field of work is uh, entomology and plant pathology. I saw in one of the slides 
you have something for uh, plant protection. But uh, the, I, I heard that uh, the red line is going to be the next Thursday for some of the, the uh, proposals to be submitted. So is there anything for four years institutions because uh, we are not uh, um, a 12K uh, students, we are a, a um, higher a education institu institution of four years uh, a, to, be, to graduate? Sure, I can take the question. So I think, you know, uh, Sergio, uh, the, the first step, the, the important step will be to really figure out what is it that you're trying to do. So you're trying to train undergraduate students. What is it that you want them to do? Do you want them to have, you know, summer internships? In that case, the REU program could be a good fit for it. Uh, the deadline for that program this year is July 1st, and my colleague, uh, Ray Ali, uh, we'll be speaking about this in, in the next couple of minutes. Um, if you want to work on curriculum development, maybe the HEC program that my colleague Irma Lawrence will speak of in the next couple of minutes as well will be a good fit for your idea. But here, I think the main challenge will be to decide what type of project you want to develop, what type of activities you want to fund support for. Um, and that will be the main, the, the main step to really figure out what is it that you want to do what is it that your institution has the capacity and the need to carry out? So I, I believe like the, the slide that Peter showed earlier with the pipeline could be a good, uh, a good way. And you can really, on your browser, you can just search for NIFA pipeline and it will take you to that, to that uh, specific infographic with, where it shows the programs that support activities at the four year uh, institution level. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Carlos. And what I would like to do is to have some, uh, to develop some research programs uh, with, the, with students in this institution, because uh, the plant protection in general, integrated pest management uh, or plant uh, pathology is, mm -hmm. is something we, ha we don't have very well developed here, and I'm trying to develop it. So that's why I would like to have some uh, projects to promote the uh, the, uh, and to develop some capacities uh, to do research in the field of uh, plant sure. protection. Yeah, um, if you wish to, we can actually chat more offline. If you want to send me an email, we can set up a time. A time. So my sure. email, my name, that last name, at usda.gov. Uh, could, could you please send it by uh, the chat? Mine well, is then, here. I would, I would send it by uh, you, mine. Mine is... Well, uh, okay, so... You... I think there's an important question in the chat that I, I kind of want to touch on before we, we go too fast. And there's a question that says, could a PI submit an application to FAME or any program, right? In conjunction with an AFRI research proposal as a way to broaden the impact of the research. So my answer to that will be yes, but the important part is that the project cannot overlap. There cannot be a significant overlap between both projects. They can always complement and you can make the case within throughout through both of the applications, but they can, there cannot be a, a, a complete overlap between functions because uh, we at NIFA, we have part of our functions is that we need to ensure that the taxpayer dollars are being used in a smart way, in an efficient way, so we do not fund duplication of efforts. So I just wanted to touch that one before uh, we move. And you can apply to every single program that you're eligible for and that your idea uh, fits within the program goals and objectives. Okay, do we have more questions, uh, Ara, from, from, um, from the group? I know we have uh, quite a few on Fane, and uh, Dr. Smith is answering many of those. I'd urge you to read the RFAs. It will, each of the RFAs will talk about the eligibility uh, that's required for that specific program. There's a question in here, um, maybe a couple questions related to international engagement. And many of the programs do have a component of international engagement. So you just need to look at the request for applications and see which of these programs does offer that uh, opportunity. 
All right, are there any more uh, ones for that people want to ask? They raise their hands. Uh, there's not any more. I think there's uh, a few more questions in the Q&A. Like you mentioned um, that uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Ortiz are answering right now in the Q&A. Uh, but no, no one else have the hand raised. Okay, why don't we then move on and uh, I, I think that uh, our national program leaders can be responding to these questions as we uh, talk about the other programs. So uh, let's uh, now go into our higher education programs. These are uh, focused on two-year colleges, four-year colleges and universities, master's programs, and there's uh, also programs associated with doctoral and postdoctoral fellowships. So I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Ray Ali to lead us off. Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. And thank you, Dr. Peter. So the first uh, program that I'll speak towards is REEU, the Research and Extension Experiences for Undergraduate Programs. Uh, which is a component of the Education and Workforce Development, RFA, which is a component of the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, which Dr. Ortiz was speaking towards earlier. So the focus of REEU is to provide uh, experiential learning opportunities for undergraduate students uh, having research and or extension outreach components. Uh, so the focus of our EEU projects is that uh, the experiences be hands-on, uh, that at least 50% of the undergraduate fellows come from outside the host institution, uh, and that there's the uh, additional maintenance activities associated there. Part of the REEU priority as well is an opportunity for an education and coordination uh, network where one site would host opportunities for funded REEU projects for linkages uh, and additional development for awardees. Uh, next slide, please. So the budget requests are as indicated within this PowerPoint slide. Uh, the term is four or five years. Uh, there is half a million dollars available specifically for the education coordination network. Uh, just gently what I'd share as well is uh, with regards to the proposal limits per institution, there is no proposal limit per institution, but there is a limit of two awards per lead institution. Again, the focus can be in research, education, extension, or integrated projects only in standard and phase grants as well. Uh, this deadline is actually upcoming within uh, the next 20 days or so. And you will find uh, this type of similar lexicon, if you will, with project types and grant types specific to uh, AFRI projects. Next slide, please. Also, uh, and these are some non-AFRI um, programs, is the Higher Education Multicultural Scholars Program, which uh, provides grants to institutions to support a cohort of undergraduate students uh, who are pursuing a baccalaureate degree in the food and agricultural sciences or the doctor of veterinary medicine degree. So, Part of the components of meritorious or successful uh, multicultural scholars program awards is that they are innovative uh, and that they are novel and that they are relevant innovation with regards to recruitment, innovation with regards to mentoring and uh, preventing uh, attrition for that respective cohort of students. There is also uh, a focus upon underrepresented, underserved groups as defined by the institution uh, or the college or the department in their case for support, okay, with regards to their proposal. Next slide, please. All right, and there is also a special experiential learning component that's part of the Multicultural Scholars Program, which is 
it pretty much exactly what it sounds. It's a, a, a unique experiential learning uh, opportunity that is going to be uh, undertaken by uh, the undergraduate scholar over the course of the grant. It's grant type standard grants, project is education, of course, and the application deadline has passed. I would just ask that you take a look at that kind of scheduling of it all uh, because uh, the proposal deadline was February 8th of this year. Uh, off the top of my head, the RFA was uh, posted in December of the prior year. So it would not be uncommon to look for that similar type of schedule for the upcoming year. Next slide, please. Somewhat analogous uh, now, if you look at the Multicultural Scholars Program providing institutional uh, awards to support a cohort of undergraduate students, uh, the National Needs Fellows would be a uh, comparable type of grant program, but that focus, instead of it being on undergraduate students, is on new master's students or new doctoral students. Uh, again, the focus being on innovation uh, with regards to recruitment and training and mentoring and, and uh, student support. Uh, there is a focus on increasing the diversity of uh, graduate students uh, within the food and agricultural sciences and somewhat analogous to MSP as well, where you had that special experiential learning opportunity that could be bought for by the applicant. Within the National Needs Fellowships, we have the International uh, Research Study or Thesis Dissertation uh, Travel Allowance as well. So the student eligibility for National Needs Fellows are new master's students and new doctoral students. Both within the Multicultural Scholars Program and the National Needs Fellows Program, there is a recruitment window uh, typically of one year uh, that is provided for the awardee to recruit uh, and then begin the matriculation of it all for their respective cohort of students. Next slide, please. Okay, so the total uh, award for the National Needs Fellows is 262,000 and a half uh, with a de facto limit per institution awards, typically up to no more than two uh, awards per institution for a maximum of 525,000. Again, the application deadline uh, was in January earlier this year. Next slide, please. As part of the component of the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative uh, within the Education and Workforce Development component, uh, you've had uh, my good friend and doctor, uh, colleague, Dr. Carlos, speak towards uh, the Agriculture and Workforce Training, Professional Development for Agricultural Literacy, also housed within that education and workforce development RFA is the research and extension experiences for undergraduates that I had spoken towards earlier, and also the pre-doctoral and the postdoctoral fellowships. Fain from Dr. Maurice was also in that EWD component as well. So with the pre-doctoral fellowship, again, within AFRI and within the education and workforce development, the, the purpose of, of these, and I'm going to speak towards the pre-doctoral and the post-doctoral fellowships, are hyper-individualized uh, training opportunities for the fellow that cover a pretty broad swath of the food and agricultural sciences, as indicated by the six farm bill priority areas, okay? That is all provided within the RFA, but those six farm bill priority areas uh, range from ag economics and rural communities to ag science and technology, the whole gamut of food safety and health, uh, plant health and protection, animal health and protection, and uh, what have you. So uh, with that, the focus for the pre-doctoral fellows is the individual pre-doctoral uh, individual is the project director. Okay, so there's a nuance there uh, the pre-doc candidate is the project director for the application, uh, and they must be the sole project director listed there. Next slide, please. 
So the total for the pre-docs is 180,000 for a total of up to three years as indicated in this slide. However, with the pre-doctoral fellowships and with the post-doctoral fellowships, when I talked about the individualized training, part of a way to think towards this as indicated within the RFA is that there are four primary components to the application, and that's the individualized career development plan, the mentoring plan, the evaluation plan, and the project plan. And the project can be a project in research, education, extension, or an integrated project involving two of the aforementioned components within those six farm bill priority areas, okay? Uh, next slide, please. So rather than going back to pre-docs, just uh, their proposal deadline was just uh, a little bit ago within the past two weeks. Akin to the pre-docs is the post-docs. Uh, this uh, effort is to develop new scientists and professionals within the food and agricultural sciences. And as per the Farm Bill, uh, you'll notice that there is a window of prescribed eligibility uh, that is based upon the application deadline. So say for example, this year, uh, the eligibility window was January 1st of 2018 and no later than February 18th of 2022. Well, that is all based upon this year's deadline. So next year that window will be modified, but again, the window is from January 1st, three years prior to nine months after the application deadline of which those doctoral degree requirements must be satisfied. Again, the postdoctoral scholar is the project director. Next slide, please. And this year, uh, the, the total uh, allowable for uh, requests for postdoctoral scholars, uh, fellows uh, is $225,000 for project periods of up to two years. Uh, that application deadline uh, was this past May 20th. Next slide, please. Thank you kindly. Okay, I'm the next person. I'm uh, at the acting national program leader uh, and division director for the capacity building grants for non-land grant colleges of agriculture. We like to use acronyms in NIFA, so this is NLGCA. Um, this is a program that's focused on non-land grant schools, which have to be certified that they have uh, agricultural programs. Um, and so there are approximately 72 institutions that have gone through the uh, certification process. So you have to be eligible to be able to apply for these particular, uh, for this particular program. It's focusing on building capacity at those institutions, um, not only in education, but also in research and outreach slash extension activities. So it's pertinent to this discussion because many of the institutions do put in uh, grants uh, proposals that focus on education. So what you need to do to be successful in this program is to really focus on a, a, an issue or a problem uh, that's facing um, the, the, the nation or the region, uh, or it's of local interest in the agriculture and food sciences, uh, and also uh, the need areas in education, research, and extension that are stated in the request for applications. There is opportunities uh, to put in what they call an in integrated grant that combines uh, two of these functions so it could be education and research uh, would be an integrated project. This particular grant also allows for uh, asking for funds for the purchase of equipment and infrastructure, uh, not for construction of buildings, but for getting uh, infrastructure needed for um, developing faculty for, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and also for development of faculty and for development of graduate assistantships. It does support, uh, I know there was a question in the uh, Q&A box about other areas besides agriculture and food sciences. 
this does uh, take in uh, social and behavioral sciences, and you may collaborate with international partners in this, in this program. Next slide. So uh, as I mentioned before, you need to apply for uh, this designation. Uh, if then there's a listing of who is who are the eligible uh, institutions. So you can go there and see if your institution is eligible. Uh, and this will allow you to put up to two proposals per institution. The uh, amounts of the awards are between $30,000 that's uh, for a planning grant up to $750,000, which would be in uh, uh, multiple institutions working together. Uh, in this case, uh, there was a question also about matching uh, requirements for different programs. This is an example of a program that does not require matching. Uh, and we have had uh, typically the, uh, the uh, applications are due in October. But please, uh, for this coming year, please check your calendar, RFA calendar to see when that will exactly, uh, those applications will be due. The RFA will come out perhaps uh, two months before the uh, due date for the, for the uh, applications. And if you do have any questions, please contact me. All right, why don't we move on to Dr. Irma Lawrence. She's going to talk about the Higher Education Challenge Grants Program. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to talk about the Higher Education Challenge Grants Program. It's well, one of the flagship programs of the, in education at the agency. And what we're trying to do is strengthen uh, the institution's capacity, uh, strengthen the curriculum, their faculty, the equipment uh, that they have for teaching, the way they deliver the, uh, the, the teaching and recruit and retain students. And what we try to do is respond to some identified needs in the food and ag sciences. Um, I tell uh, applicants, usually when you're looking to put together a higher education challenge grants, well, uh, think about what problems uh, does your program have? Uh, what gaps need to be filled? So those are good questions to ask, uh, try to answer when you're thinking about a project for the higher education, a higher education challenge grants program. Uh, we're trying to attract and support uh, undergraduate and graduate students. And uh, we're trying to attract underrepresented students. Uh, we're trying to facilitate a cooperation between two or more uh, institutions. Uh, and what we're trying to do is improve the programming that exists, that keep it at your institution providing programming that is state of the art. Um, uh, we uh, actually uh, could do some funding for the students, some stipends, but not to pay tuition, but to actually do things that are beyond the, the program that you actually have to do a special research project, to uh, go and present at a conference and things like that. To be eligible to this program, you need to be a US public or private uh, nonprofit uh, college offering a bachelor degree or first professional degree. And that includes uh, DVMs and uh, the, you need to have at least one program in the area that we uh, call food and ag sciences. Next slide. Uh, the program code is ER. So when you're applying, you uh, make sure you write the right code. So we receive your application. We have four grant types and they vary in the purpose and also vary in the size or the amount of money you will be receiving. Um, we have planning grants that begin at $30,000. And it's for you to think about putting together a larger project. We have regular grants at, uh, for $150,000 uh, and the projects must be at least three years. We have uh, collaboration one grants, uh, we lovingly call them CG1s, that gives you $300,000. And we would like to have two or more institutions working together. 
And we have the largest type of grants, the Collaboration 2 grants, the CG2s, that you could receive up to $750,000, two or more institutions working together, and this time at the regional or national level. So we want the project to be a little bit more um, ambitious and uh, covering a larger uh, area. Uh, there's always proposal limits. It's uh, one collaboration. You can only apply for one collaboration. Um, and we could only give two awards per lead institution, and that does not include the planning grants. So perhaps you could get one collaboration CG1 CG, or a CG2, or a collaboration CG1 and a regular grant and a planning grant. So for uh, those of you uh, who are thinking of applying to the higher education grant, uh, the deadline, uh, the anticipated deadline is gonna be spring 2022. Uh, please again, check the RFA calendar. And if you have any questions about this program, uh, my email is there. Just do not hesitate to um, uh, contact me. Every year we uh, award about from 18 to 21 awards. Um, we tend to provide no more than five uh, planning grants. And in the past year, about maybe 10 uh, regular grants and the collaborations, uh, CG1s and CG2s, we tend to give less, uh, less awards. Uh, next slide. Okay. So okay, now we're in our question and answer uh, period again for this section. So please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A um, box or raise your hand and uh, Ara will then um, recognize you to and, and I'll let you to speak uh, uh, and ask your question. Do we have any questions? Uh, anyone's raised their hand, Ara? We don't have yet anyone who have raised their hand, but we have quite a few. I'm sorry for the I, We have quite a few in the Q&A uh, regarding NLGCA. If you want to answer a couple of those live, Peter. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and ask what those are? Yes, we have one that says, will an urban institution without an ag college but having food science program be eligible for NLGCA? Uh, you, we have a process where you apply for that eligibility, and uh, the thing to do is to uh, go through that process because what we will do is look at uh, the curriculum that you have for your food science uh, uh, major and see if it applies uh, based on the criteria that we have for NLGCA eligibility. So. I would urge you, if, if the institution and yourself are interested in, in uh, getting certified, to go through that process and um, put in all the materials that you have uh, in support of your application. Great. We have, uh, maybe this is more for Irma. Um, we have another question related to um, how do higher education collaboration grants for graduate students? Who gets the graduate students? Uh, well, typically two institutions apply and uh, you decide among the sales of, the, of what is the plan. So uh, we could fund uh, up to graduate students. So if you offer a, you're a four year institution that do not offer master's degrees, you uh, find a collaborator that does that. And the whole idea is the, the programming that you're trying to enhance, the problem that you need to solve, it could be either at the undergraduate or the graduate level. But the two institutions need to be uh, working together. Thank you, Irma. Uh, we have quite a few other ones that are a little bit more longer, so we can do answer those in directly into the Q&A, if that's okay, Peter. Uh, we don't have anyone raise their hand. Okay, so 
Okay. Um, and if you have questions, I would just put them in the Q and A, and as we go along, we'll we'll answer those. Uh, and remember, we you know you have the emails for the national program leaders for those particular programs. So um, if you have a question later on, uh, you can email that particular national program leader and uh, they will then respond to your inquiry. Okay, our next section is on minority serving institutions. And so uh, we have programs uh, that focus on education associated with these minority serving institutions. And so we will uh, proceed to uh, present those. And the first program is uh, with the 1890 schools. And uh, um, Dr. Manaharan, would you like to uh, present that? Is Dr. Manahar in there? Okay, well, I, I guess I can go ahead and maybe when he comes on, he can, uh, he can talk about it. But uh, this program is the 1890 Institution uh, Teaching Research and Extension Capacity Building Grants Program. And really what this is focusing on is uh, building that institutional teaching research and extension capacity for 1890 institutions. Uh, these institutions, there's approximately 19 of them. These are the historically black uh, colleges uh, and universities, a subset of that. And um, the major goals of this particular program uh, is really to uh, increase cultural diversity in uh, the professional workforce, and um, also to educate more students from underrepresented groups. And it's the idea here is also to uh, promote collaboration uh, among 1890 institutions and other colleges and universities and other agencies and industry and to enhance the quality of the uh, teaching, education, research, and extension at these 1890 institutions. Next slide, please. So this, uh, there are various grants. There's the professional development grant, the standard grant, and the collaborative. Uh, also, uh, you can focus on different uh, teaching, research, and extension. So our focus here today is really on these educational uh, opportunities within this program. And the budget requests are between $100,000 to $750,000. And uh, these can last anywhere from 12 months to uh, two to three years. And there are some limits in terms of um, uh, the numbers that can be on these. And the application deadline is going to be in, uh, in September. And the person to contact for this is Dr. Uh, Manaharan Muthasamy, and uh, his, his email is there below. He's uh, one of our uh, MPLs working on uh, programs associated with 1890 institutions. Okay, next uh, we will have Dr. Aaron Riley talk about uh, some of our uh, programs that are focused on education for the 1994 uh, land-grant uh, schools. Thank you, Peter. Happy Friday. I really appreciate all of you hanging on on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be able to talk to you about the tribal um, education programs that we have at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, we have the Tribal Equity Grants Program, and this is eligible to 1994 land grants. To become a 1994 land grant, you need to be in the Farm Bill. There are currently 35 active 1994 uh, institutions around the country. This particular program, it, it focuses on um, different sorts of education activities, including improving courses, enhancing teaching ability to faculty. It brings in a lot of cultural knowledge, um, 
We are working on some STEAM, um, different STEAM curriculum and really bringing in not only the STEM field, but also arts. And that'll be coming out in this new RFA. This particular program can provide stipends and invest in new technologies to teach uh, students remotely. And this is something that we've really gone to since COVID occurred. It can also help with student recruitment and retention. It can help build culturally appropriate education materials to try to engage students and uh, uh, assist them in graduating with their, their different degrees that they're going for. It also can assist with graduate students uh, to achieve their life goals and graduate students uh, to achieve their life goals. It can be used to build laboratories, conduct remedial courses, and create new degree programs. Next slide, please. The approximate budget is $400,000 per project, and it's over a four-year grant period. We award one grant per institution. It is considered an education grant. Uh, there is no collaboration that, that is required with this particular program. And the next application deadline is going to be March 15, 2022. Um, so if you are a 1994 on this program, keep in mind that, that um, you will uh, have the ability to come in in 2022, and that's for a four-year grant cycle. So the next grant cycle will not be until 2026. You can see my email below, erin.riley at usda.gov. Go ahead to the next slide. Our other newest program, which is a very exciting program, is the New Beginning for Tribal Students program. This uh, grant supports land-grant colleges and universities. So this includes the 1994 program, the, the uh, 1890, as well as the 1862s. Um, what this program does, it assists in supporting tribal students on their path to higher education. And it really is trying to graduate more tribal students uh, and get their degrees at land grant colleges and universities. So it can be used to provide institutional support to retrain, to retain and recruit students. The point of this program is to really help create a welcoming environment um, and it can be paid for mentoring, it can be used for counseling, it can be used for recruitment, retention, tutoring, scholarship, academic advising. The, the intent of this program is to really increase the numbers of tribal students that have degrees and it goes from undergraduate, it goes from AA degree to undergraduate degrees to master's degrees to PhDs all the way into postdocs. Next slide. So this program has a maximum of 500,000 total per project. It can go up to four years. So when you apply, you can apply from one up to four years. Um, there is a 100% match that is required. That is a non-federal match. The maximum that a state can receive per year is 500,000. Um, so this is something to, to keep in mind when, when you come in. Uh, there, we've had this issue before where certain states will max out. And so what we try to do is work with them and come in the next year. So we have regular and collaborative grant types. Um, and the next date in which the application deadline will be March 15th in 2022. So if you have any questions about these two education programs, please contact me at erin.riley at usda.gov. I'm happy to chat more with you about that. Some of the questions um, that I saw that were submitted prior were had to do with eligibility to um, uh, tribes. And the, these particular two programs are eligible to 1994s and land grant colleges. The tribal programs in this portfolio uh, cannot be used towards tribal individuals. They can't, they are not, not used towards individuals, but they are used for the land grant institutions. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Erin. Uh, what I would like to talk about now is the uh, Hispanic Serving Institutions Education Grants Program. 
and institutions that could apply is, is one of the 569 institutions that do have an enrollment of 25% uh, uh, enrollment of Hispanic students uh, at the time of application. And what the priorities of this program are, in, again, is to encourage uh, innovative teaching and education uh, in, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your institutions. And many people ask, do I need to have a Food and Act program to apply for the edu Education Grants program? And the answer is no. What they're trying to do is bring some Food and Act Sciences education to your institution. And what has happened over the years, some institutions that did not have a food and science program have been building the programs and developing uh, coursework based on what they have. So for example, if you have a good business school, you could do some, you know, develop some coursework in agribusiness. If you have a good uh, chemistry uh, department, you could actually uh, uh, develop some uh, water quality, so on and so forth. So the whole idea is again to develop a new curriculum, uh, degree programs, materials, library resources in the food and ag sciences. We also want to make sure uh, we prepare your faculty to teach these classes. Uh, in, we also fund instruction delivery system, uh, scientific instrumentation for teaching, uh, student experiential learning, and it's, it's student recruitment and retention activities. And again, what we're trying to do is attract and support undergraduate and graduate students from underrepresented groups to prepare them for careers in the food and art sciences and natural resources. Uh, next slide. Um, the proposed budget request, we have one, two, three uh, type of applications. The first is the conference grants for $50,000. Uh, we have regular projects. It's one institution working by itself, uh, trying to develop itself. And we have collaboration grants um, that could apply for up to a million dollars. And um, all applications uh, about the conference are for four years. Uh, we limit the number of proposals for conference to two and to collaborations to two applications per lead institution. And we can only fund two applications, uh, regular and collaboration plus a conference per lead institution. Uh, we, these projects are education teaching projects only. And uh, we anticipate a deadline of January, 2022. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, contact me. If you have never applied, to this grant, please, and you're the Chesa, you have the FTE of 25% Hispanic, please contact me. We're always looking for uh, the opportunity to bring more uh, institutions to be part of our grantees. Uh, next slide. I also have the opportunity to work the Alaska Native Serving and Native Hawaiian Serving Institutions. And again, we're trying to promote and strengthen the ability of these institutions to carry out education, apply research and related community development programs. Uh, to apply for this program, you need to be located in Alaska or Hawaii. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do in this program is enhance educational equity for underrepresented students, uh, strengthen institutional educational capacities prepare the students for career uh, related to the food and ag sciences, and maximize the development and use of resources to improve the uh, ag education uh, on, on the islands of Hawaii or Alaska. Um, let me see, uh, next slide. And as you see, we have a panel. We're trying to make these institutions uh, better at teaching food and ag sciences. Uh, the proposed budget requests for the institutions are $450,000 for a standard and $1 million for collaborative grants. Uh, and we cover a period of two or three years. Uh, we limit the, the uh, proposals uh, 
to one standard and one collaborative, collaborative uh, to be funded uh, per state. Uh, and we have about uh, $3 million uh, that they're divided evenly between Alaska and Hawaii. Again, we have an anticipated uh, deadline of February, 2022. And you could contact me if you have any questions. Um, this is all based on funding. So if the funding changes for next year, uh, we will uh, modify the RFA to uh, meet the requirements of the funding legislation. Uh, next slide. Um, we also fund uh, the insular uh, programs. So we have three types of programs for the insular areas. And again, uh, what we're trying to do is help the, the programming at the islands to improve their quality, improve the number of students uh, that are pursuing careers in the food and ag sciences. We're trying to strengthen these institutions and, uh, and the insular areas. And sometimes I get asked, uh, I'm not in an insular area, but I could work with them. I said, you could work with the insular areas and the institutions and the insular areas, but the lead institution needs to be uh, the institution in the uh, insular areas. Uh, the distant education grants program is dedicated to uh, develop curriculum that actually could be uh, uh, performed or uh, used or uh, presented to the students through distance education technology. And you can use the funding to buy equipment, acquisition of the necessary infrastructure to teach students and teachers about technology in the classroom. Um, you could uh, use the funding for faculty development, uh, faculty training, implementing the projects, uh, uh, leadership development, and actually you could use some of the funding for uh, supporting students. And thinking about the the recent times uh, during COVID, the fact that some of these institutions had received these grants, uh, they were able to actually to continue uh, offering programming uh, while we were all online. Um, actually, I have one of the grantees uh, mentioned that how did NIFA knew that at one point we will need to be fully uh, operational via distance education. Uh, but anyway, um, this program is here. We have $800,000 available. Uh, next slide. Um, and uh, the standard projects will give you up to $150,000 and the planning activities, uh, the planning grants will give you up to $30,000. Uh, we limit the number of uh, proposals to be uh, three, up to three standard applications and up to two collaborative applications per lead institution. Anticipated uh, deadline is January uh, 2022nd. The second, the second type of uh, insular program is the resident instruction grants for institutions of higher education in insular areas, which we kindly call RIA. And again, we're trying to uh, fund the, the institutions to strengthen their capabilities. Uh, similar things include the libraries, curriculum, faculty, uh, faculty development, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're trying to do is attract and support on the graduate and graduate students. And what we're trying to do is fund projects in unidentified areas of national need. Um, we fund initiatives that support cooperation between two or more insular areas, or, or even with uh, the institutions with units of the state government, even USDA agencies, uh, for example. And um, what we're trying to do again is help the institutions at the islands to improve their programming and the outreach and ability to serve more students. Uh, next slide. 
uh, the ACFE, the Agriculture and Food Science Facilities and Equipment Program for Insular Areas, uh, shares an RFA with RIA. And um, what we're trying to support here is activities uh, that require you to acquire or renovate facilities at the insular institutions. Uh, buy uh, the necessary equipment for conducting agricultural research and support tropical and subtropical agricultural activities. Those uh, activities could include pest and disease research. Next slide. Again, uh, RIA and ACFE, uh, the standard grants are up to $150,000 for up to four years, planning again up to $30,000 for up to two years. Um, again, we have a limit on the number of applications for RIA is three and the, the limit for the applications for ACFE is two per lead institution. Uh, the application deadline is February, 2022. Uh, next slide. So we're back to questions, comments. Well, thank you all. Let's let's uh, open this up now. If you have questions about uh, this particular section related to programs in the minority serving institutions, or in just in general related uh, to some of the other um, programs that were uh, presented today, so please uh, enter your questions in the question and answer box or raise your hand and we will endeavor to answer those. Ara, do we have anyone who's raised their hand? We don't. We don't have anyone raise their hand yet. Okay, we have one. Got free. Let me get, bring him to. If you want to unmute yourself, God free, we will be able to hear you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, will it be possible to get copies of these uh, presentations by email? Did you hear me? Yes, yes, we heard you. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, we are going to be providing you with the PowerPoint because it does have a lot of information and we covered a lot of information. So uh, you might want to have that so you can look it over and uh, utilize it for uh, whatever purpose you like. Okay. Do you have another question? We have one more, someone else. Um, okay. We have Noel Novello. Yes, hello. Um, thank you for all this information. Um, very informative and very helpful. Um, so, Right now, in the general area of um, aquaculture fisheries um, uh, in, in the U.S., um, and uh, being faculty in an HBCU, I'm thinking about um, recruitment uh, and retention of uh, minority women underrepresented uh, groups into our program. Um, what of which of the um, which of the grant opportunities would be would you advise for me to consider as a better fit if there is um, funding for for this? Do any of our NPLs want to respond to that? Sure. Good afternoon, and this is Ray, and and uh, maybe I'll give it a go. And Noel, thank you kindly for that question. Uh, I would offer that if the the focus is upon uh, recruitment and retention of underrepresented audiences. Potential avenues for you to explore would be the research and extension experiences for undergraduates, uh, opportunity within the Agriculture and Food, Food Research Initiative, or REEU, as well as the Multicultural Scholars Program if the focus is at the undergraduate level. And then at the graduate level, it would be the National Needs Fellowships. Thank you. I might also add, Noel, if you're looking for um, uh, tribal students, that the um, New Beginning for Tribal Students program is one that is a fantastic opportunity. Um, it's got a very high funding rate, and I would definitely say 
uh, if you would like to get Native students or you have a Native population uh, within your, your college to apply for this program in 2022. Please reach out if you have questions. Uh, absolutely, that's actually a very uh, an excellent suggestion. Um, right now, I, I have a student from an HSI. You know, I'm her major professor, and she's here uh, at the at Kentucky State University. And for sure, you know, I would like to be able to recruit from other uh, institutions that serve underrepresented groups. So I'll definitely send you an email. That would be fantastic. Um, I know that in the questions that we were that were submitted prior, there were some questions about international work, and um, the tribal programs can do international um, travel. It cannot fund international students, however, but it can collaborate with institutions um, at other uh, international um, groups as long as it's really benefiting the 1994 or the um, land grant institution. Okay, are there any more questions? That's it for right now. There was a question, I think, about insular. What are insular areas? Uh, what are insular institutions? I think um, Dr. Lawrence responded to that. Um, there was a question about the recording of the webinar. Uh, that we will probably post too, but it has to go through some processing uh, uh, to make it um, certified so we, we it will take us a little time to get that up there so there is one question maybe for irma could you define insular areas and, and yes uh, eric i just typed it in uh includes uh eight insular areas they're american samoa commonwealth of the northern mariana islands uh the commonwealth of puerto rico the Federated States of Micronesia, and actually I missed Guam in the typing, uh, the Republic of uh, the Marshall Islands, the Republic of Palau, and the US uh, Virgin Islands. And I think I missed uh, Guam for some reason. I'm gonna be in bad shape with the boss. It's okay, it's okay. But don't forget Guam. It's a it's an important uh, territory. Guam too. Yes. Uh, any other questions that people have? I know there's some things in the chat room. I haven't really looked at that. Um, all right. Well, thank you. There's a nice compliment about the the webinar and um, that we're investing in some very important areas and. Uh, if you do have suggestions uh, or ideas uh, or maybe things that we're missing, please, please let us know. Peter, there's oh, another thanks. question right now uh, that Aaron um, could help us answer live just right now. Aaron? Uh, uh, sure. Um, is this the one about uh, the, the CPA audit, yes. Okay, yeah, so so now I, I know for for the programs, a lot of the education programs or most of the education programs that an audit is not, um, or CPA or audit is not required to um, to apply for the, the grants. And, and I am not sure about some of the AFRI programs. I do, do not believe so. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Peter, and we will find a definitive, definitive answer for some of the other programs. But for sure, none of, I think the programs that you heard of today requires a CPA or an audit. It does require a budget, a budget narrative. And if you have matching, where your matching sources are gonna come from in a one page document, uh, documenting if it's a, depending on what ratio it is, if it's a dollar to dollar ratio. So thank you for your question. Thank you, Aaron. I just want to say one more thing. Uh, here are our contact information. Again, we all have said it. Our job is to serve you and to answer questions 
Uh, we all have some dedicated programs. Think about the programs you would like to consider applying. And please, please uh, contact us via email uh, and send us an email and, and uh, or let's set a time for a conference call. So we'll go answer your questions. And uh, we would like to receive, you know, know of your ideas and, and, and have you apply for the programs. This is our job. This is what we're here for, to serve you all. Yes, and uh, I want to thank you all for your participation in, um, in, on a Friday afternoon. That was probably an act of dedication uh, on your part. And please follow up. If you do have any questions, uh, please contact us. You know the names, you've seen the faces. Uh, and so uh, please, please uh, send us any information, uh, any questions that you have. Uh, this contact information, again, will be in this presentation, uh, which you'll get. And uh, appreciate your time. I appreciate the, uh, the staff's time as well. Uh, and uh, thank you all. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's it for today. Um, and this will be an ongoing process. Thank you all.